What's up, my comic comrades? The new year is almost upon us, which means my most anticipated new series of the year, The Book of Boba Fett, is just days away. The baddest bounty hunter in the galaxy has come an extremely long way since his very brief appearances in the original Star Wars trilogy. Even with his minimal screen time, the mystique and look of the character resonated with so many people that he quickly became a fan favorite. I mean, in my opinion, the bounty hunters and Mandalorians are just as cool, if not cooler, than the Jedi and Sith. Especially over the past few years as creators like Dave Filoni, Jon Favreau, Charles Soule, and Greg Pak have fleshed out these characters so well. But before Boba Fett hits the small screen in his own series, we're here to give you all the complete history of the most infamous bounty hunter from a galaxy far, far away, Boba Fett. Boba Fett first appeared on screen in the Star Wars Holiday Special in 1978, where he was portrayed in 2D animation. But the first time he ever appeared in public was a month before the Star Wars Holiday Special in the Marin County Parade alongside Darth Vader, both in their screen-used costumes. That's right, Boba Fett first appeared to the public in a county parade before people even knew who the heck he was. Anyway, as for some real-world history to Boba Fett, the Boba Fett character was actually meant to be part of an army of troopers which George called Super Troopers. The plan was to build a hundred of these suits to have them be the Empire's upgraded stormtroopers, which is why the suit was originally white and has since become known as the prototype Boba Fett armor. But there ended up being a budget issue with George saying they didn't have enough money to make them into an army. So he did what any great creator does and he pivoted, saying let's make the suit into a different type of character, turning it into a bounty hunter. At which point art director for Empire Strikes Back, Joe Johnston, painted the entire suit silver and then went over it with the now iconic green, red, and yellow color palette. George then looked at it and said, that's a cool character. People like the bad guys. And as we know from there, the character went on to become one of the most beloved characters in all of cinema, not just Star Wars, with his now iconic T-visor, which harkens back to the medieval knight style. Boba also gives off Western gunslinger vibes, which is drawn out of George's love for Western films. It's kind of crazy how popular the character became off the bat, as he only had four lines of dialogue in the original trilogy and six minutes and 32 seconds worth of screen time. Yet he still became one of the most popular characters in the franchise, which speaks a lot to the character's design and overall demand. Meaner. And as we know, the character would spark one of the coolest aspects of the Star Wars universe, the Mandalorians. But with that said, let's see what its fictional origin is all about. We get the beginning of Boba Fett's origin in Star Wars Attack of the Clones, which is the second film of the prequel trilogy. In the film, we learn that Boba Fett is actually a clone of his father, Jango Fett, who was a bounty hunter, foundling, and Mandalorian who fought in the Mandalorian Civil Wars. Anyway, we find out when Jango agreed to be the genetic template for the Republic's clone army created by the Kaminoans, he had one condition, which was they had to give Jango one unaltered clone for him to raise as a son. This unaltered clone and son of his was, of course, Boba Fett. Jango trained Boba on Kamino to be a great warrior just like him, teaching his clone all of the skills he's acquired as a bounty hunter. Young Boba was even taught survival and martial arts skills and became great with the blaster even as a child. He would also undergo clone trooper training as well as his father teaching him how to command and work his weapon systems on his father's ship, the Slave One. He also became very knowledgeable and familiar with the members of the Kaminoan government. Boba would even accompany his father on bounty missions like the time he went with him alongside Nilda, Rin, and Tyver, who were hired by the male Twi'lek to capture his daughter and bring her back alive. Boba ended up performing so well on the mission that Jango believed that this was a great start to his legacy. Not long after the Clone Wars, Jango was hired by the Confederate of Independent Systems, which was founded by Sith Count Dooku, to kill Senator Padme, who was an outspoken opponent of the Penitential War. But Jango was unsuccessful thanks to Padme being under the watch of Jedi's Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker. This would lead to Obi-Wan ultimately tracking Jango down to Kamino. When Obi-Wan arrived at Kamino, he learned of the clone army and requested to see Jango, whom all the clones were a copy of. The Kaminoan Tan Wei brought Obi-Wan to Jango's quarters, where Boba greeted them. And off the bat, Boba was not a fan of Obi-Wan wanting to meet his father. While Kenobi started speaking with Jango about the clone army, he implied he knew Jango was behind the assassination attempt of Padme, with Boba looking at Obi-Wan with anger. Once Obi-Wan left, Jango knew that he had been discovered, so he told Boba to immediately prepare to leave Kamino. But while Jango and Boba were loading the Slave One to leave Kamino, Obi-Wan discovered them attempting to flee, at which point Jango and Obi-Wan would start to battle. But Boba was not about to just sit there, so he started using the Slave One's blaster cannons, shooting them at Kenobi in an attempt to kill him. In the end, Jango was able to defeat Kenobi and fly away with Boba in the Slave One. From here, the father and son would head to Genosis, where the Separatist leaders had all gathered. But tragedy came for young Boba Fett when Jango was decapitated on Genosis by Jedi Master Mace Windu. After which he fled Genosis on the Slave One, with Boba Fett now hating the Jedi and vowed vengeance on them, believing them all to be madmen. Sometime later, Boba joined the team of bounty hunters that included Aura Singh, Boss, and Costas to carry out his revenge against Mace Windu for killing his father. Together, Boba and the bounty hunters crafted a plan to assassinate the Jedi Master aboard the Republic vessel, Endurance. On the Endurance, Boba pretended to be a young clone cadet, using the fact that he was genetically identical to the other young clones to his advantage. 
damage. He would also use the nickname Lucky during this time. Now, obviously Boba's plan that he had with the other bounty hunters didn't work out, as we know Windu died fighting Emperor Palpatine. Young Boba would continue to have run-ins with the Jedi, hoping to enact his revenge, even becoming a bounty hunter in his own right, forming a syndicate based on Tatooine. He would learn a lot about the bounty hunter trade from Singh, but also Cad Bane and Onaka. As Boba Fett's career evolved, he would inherit his father's Mandalorian armor and rebuilt it in his father's memory. Because remember, Jango was a foundling who fought in the Mandalorian Civil War. His father's newly designed armor was now painted green, red, and yellow, as well as Boba adding the addition of the braids from Padawans and Wookiees he had killed, hanging from his right shoulder, displayed as trophies of his fallen victims. Which is pretty badass and something I found out fairly recently. Obviously, I always noticed them, but I thought they were simply there just for decoration. But nope, I was wrong. Anyway, now donning his father's modified armor, he would become the Boba Fett we all know and love. As such, he only took on certain assignments, but the few jobs he did take, he devoted himself to them with fanatical skill. Boba Fett would soon assume the mantle Jango had left as a notorious bounty hunter, with Boba eventually becoming known as the best bounty hunter in the galaxy. And with that, friends, let's jump into story arcs. By the time of the Galactic Civil War, Boba Fett was known as one of the best bounty hunters in the galaxy, if not the best, and worked as one of Jabba the Hutt's go-to mercenaries. In the first issue of the 2015 Darth Vader Marvel Comics title, which is part of Star Wars canon, Vader hires Boba Fett saying there is an X-Wing pilot he knew in Obi-Wan Kenobi. He left this planet aboard a smuggling vessel called the Millennium Falcon. Fett answers, I know the ship, dead or alive. Vader says, alive. I need him alive. Do not fail me. Fett answers, the only time I fail is if you hired me to fail. I'll get the kid. Then in issue six of the series, Fett tells Vader, I lost him. He replies, that is most disappointing. Fett says, he got lucky. Vader replies, did you bring me anything of value, Bounty Hunter? He answers, not much, just his name, Skywalker. Vader doesn't reply after this, with Boba saying, we're done here then. In his silence, we see Vader remembers Padme telling him she's pregnant, now knowing that that X-Wing pilot he's looking for is none other than his own son. We would then see what happened between Boba Fett and Luke Skywalker in Star Wars issues five and six from 2015. In the issue, Boba tracked Luke and R2 down at Tatooine, more specifically, Ben house, which was just raided by sand people. Boba then throws a flash grenade in the house, blinding Luke, and Luke then says, R2, I can't see. What happened? Boba Fett then hit him with the butt of the rifle, saying, that was the butt of the rifle that's now pointed at your head. Stay down, Skywalker. Luke then punches Boba Fett in the stomach, but that doesn't work because he's wearing armor. Boba even says, don't waste my time. Luke then says, armor? What are stormtroopers doing in the Dune Sea? Fett says, you'd have to ask the stormtroopers. Don't move. As Luke thinks he's a stormtrooper because, remember, Boba Fett blinded him with a flash grenade before he could see who was hitting him. Skywalker then asks, why can't I see? What was that, a flash grenade? Fett then starts walking towards him with cuffs in his hand saying, I said don't move. Skywalker then tells him, if you were gonna kill me, you would have done it already. Who hired you? Where are you planning on taking me? With Boba Fett responding by kicking him in the face saying, you could have walked, but I can just as easily carry you to my ship. At this point, Luke gets back up, igniting his lightsaber saying, I'm not going anywhere with you. But Boba tells him, you can't fight me blind. You couldn't even fight me if you could see. Luke responds saying, Jedis don't need eyes. But Boba Fett tells him, maybe, but you're no Jedi. Luke says, no, I'm not, but I knew one once, and this was his home. You should have never come here. As he starts swinging his lightsaber at Boba Fett, Luke is able to get a few good strikes in, saying, your armor is noisy, meaning he can't see him, but he can hear where he is. At which point, Boba Fett responds, saying, so is your mouth, as he lunges towards Luke, cutting him with his vibro blades. Fett then says, you're running out of options and blood. Put down the lightsaber. But Luke says, no, Ben would never. Fett then tells him, Kenobi is dead. He can't help you. But Luke just tells him, he already has. Boba Fett says, you're right. I'm supposed to bring you in alive. But alive just just means breathing, as he points his blaster rifle at Luke. With Luke saying a Jedi can feel the force flowing through him, Boba Fett answers, feel this, firing at Luke, but he's able to block it with his lightsaber. At this point, Boba Fett uses his jetpack to tackle Luke and land on top of him, ultimately forcing Luke's lightsaber down into his face. But before he could finish the job, a box mysteriously flies into the back of Boba Fett's head, knocking him out. With Luke getting up saying, R2, is this the box we found? How did I? We'll figure it out some other time. I can't see. Leave me out of here, buddy. This all comes full circle from what I told you earlier, where we see Boba Fett returning to Vader saying, I lost him. But his name is Skywalker, unknown to Boba Fett, telling Vader he has a son. Now this all leads us to the capturing of Han Solo from the original trilogy. In The Empire Strikes Back, we see Vader has hired several bounty hunters, one of which is Boba Fett to capture the Millennium Falcon. And Boba Fett was the only one who was able to figure out how the Millennium Falcon escaped Imperial Pursuit by hiding among garbage and tracked the ship down to Cloud City on Bespin. Boba Fett would then inform Darth Vader of their destination, at which point Vader and his stormtroopers would infiltrate the city. And you guys know what happens from here. Once Vader arrived, he forced Lando into portraying his friends, ultimately leading to Vader freezing Han Solo in Carbonite, which he did as a test because he also wanted to do the same thing to Luke, but wanted to make sure it would work without killing his son. Anyway, after Hans is frozen in Carbonite, he gives it to Boba Fett to take the job of the Hut so he can claim his bounty. And we just got a brand new story that wrapped up called War of the Bounty Hunters that explains what happened to Boba Fett as he's taking the Carbonite Han Solo to Jabba the Hut.
But it's actually a really dope story that I'm not going to get into right now because we're actually covering the story in its entirety on Sunday here on the channel. Anyway, after Boba Fett delivers Han to Jabba the Hutt, he dies at the beginning of Return of the Jedi when Solo inadvertently knocked Boba Fett into the Sarlacc pit. But recently in Mandalorian Season 2, it was revealed that Boba Fett did not die and survived somehow, which I'm sure is going to be explained in the Book of Boba Fett series. In any case, we see him track down Mando and ask for his father's armor back, which Mando gladly agrees to as he says it's rightfully his since his father fought in the Mandalorian Civil War. Boba Fett then helps Mando find the location of Grogu, with his arc in Season 2 ending with him killing Bib Fortuna and taking the throne of the Underworld, which formerly belonged long to Jabba the Hutt. But that's where his story last left off, which brings us all the way to his brand new book of Boba Fett series on Disney Plus and the reason for today's episode. But with that said, guys, it's now time for Powers and Abilities. Boba Fett doesn't have any superhuman abilities. He's just a clone of his father, Jango Fett, who was a human. With that said, it only makes the fact that he's one of the deadliest people in the galaxy that much more impressive. Boba Fett is widely known as the best bounty hunter in the galaxy, widely feared and respected, which is due to his training that began at a very young age. His father taught him everything he knew, and when he was killed by Mace Windu, Boba continued his training from some of the best bounty hunters in the galaxy, like Aura Singh, Cad Bane, Bosk, and more. He's a highly skilled tactician and hand-to-hand -hand combatant, as demonstrated in The Mandalorian Season 2, where he dons his Mandalorian armor once again and demonstrates his brute force. He easily overpowers stormtroopers, throwing them around and beating them up like ragdolls. He's also an incredibly skilled weapons master and marksman. Carrying an EE3 carbine rifle, a miniature flamethrower on his gauntlet, dart launcher, knee pads, his blaster pistol, and of course his iconic Z6 jetpack with rocket launcher. He also has his iconic starship, the Slave One. Again, the dude is a fantastic brawler and weapons master, as well as being a fantastic leader and the best bounty hunter in the galaxy. All of which make him easily one of the coolest Star Wars characters ever created. But now it's time to move on to reading recommendations. With Boba Fett really being a product of the Star Wars movies first, there are a lot of watch recommendations to go along with our reading recommendations. So first watch Star Wars Episode 2 Attack of the Clones, Episode 5 The Empire Strikes Back, and Episode 6 Return of the Jedi. Then read the 2015 Darth Vader series, the 2015 Star Wars series, and the brand new War of the Bounty Hunters Limited series. Before wrapping up by watching The Mandalorian Season 2 and of course the Book of Boba Fett which is about to start streaming on Disney+. Plus. That's pretty much going to make you a Boba Fett expert. First up, for the week of December 29th, we have Superman 78, Issue 5. As Brainiac attacks Metropolis for Lex Luthor's transgressions, Superman works as fast as he can to escape the bottled city of Kandor. Now we have DC vs. Vampires, Issue 3. Vampires are hunting on the streets of Gotham City as the coming undead plague makes its first move. Batman's investigation into the disappearance of Andrew Bennett takes him into the sewers beneath the Hall of Justice, where he makes a stunning discovery. Here we have Teen Titans Academy, Issue 10. The fall of Teen Titans Academy begins with what looks like Red X vs. Shazam. Next, we have the death of Doctor Strange, Issue 4. Who will be the new Sorcerer Supreme? Someone has to stop this giant mystical threat devouring all magic. And it can't be the Avengers or the Fantastic Four or the X-Men. And finally, we have Star Wars Bounty Hunters issue 19. As Crimson Rain has ignited the underworld in All Out War, Tonga's team of bounty hunters, including Boss, Zuckus, and Tasu Leech, are running out of time to save one young girl who can stop the conflict between the syndicates. And that's going to bring today's episode of Variant to a close. But if you enjoyed today's episode, check out this one right here. And if you like all of our content, subscribe, like, and comment. It always helps the channel out. But other than that, I'll see you guys next time when I talk about all things comics.